welcome. Thanks for joining us. I just want to invite you to sing along with us as we declare his praises together.
soul praise Him for He is thy health and salvation. When all ye who hear now do His temple draw near, praise Him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth. Oh, it shelters the under his wings, yeah, so gently sustaineth. Oh, and hast thou not seen? Granted in what he ordained. Praise the Lord. We sing praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Oh, and surely his goodness and mercy. Your daily attending. Oh, and ponder anew what the Almighty can do. Oh, if with His love He be Thanks for joining us at Encounter. We're so glad you're here. If at any point you have trouble with the stream, take a look in the chat area where one of our hosts will have posted the link or head directly to our website and the video will be posted on our homepage. If you are in need of prayer, you can click the request prayer button on the right, bottom right of your screen and one of our hosts will be available to pray with you. Thank you so much for your faithful giving during this time. Because of your support, we are able to continue serving our Encounter families, our community and around the world. If you feel led to give today, just head to our website and you'll find ways to give there. The best way to stay connected with what's happening here at Encounter is by following us on Facebook and Instagram. We have a lot of exciting things coming up and we don't want you to miss any of it. One exciting new event has been our Saturday night in-person service. It was awesome being able to gather together outside and worship last Saturday. If you'd like to join us at these in-person services, be sure to register the week before on our website. We always have room for more. Another exciting event coming up this month is for all our Encounter families, a family chalk festival on Saturday, September 26th. This is your chance to personalize a part of our main courtyard using sidewalk chalk, as well as a chance to connect with other families, social distancing, of course. Another bonus, we'll provide the chalk. All you need to do is head over to our website and register for a start time for your family. We have lots of space on the patio, so we hope you can come. Well, be sure to pop in the live chat to let us know you're, where you're joining us from, and we'll see you in there. Hello, Encounter family. Thank you for joining me here. Uh, we have had a very exciting week here on campus because this was the week, this last weekend, was 
the first in-person gathering here on our campus, which was really fun. So as you're watching this, uh, on this weekend, we're having our second in-person gathering. Looking forward to that very much. And we're gonna actually have a baby dedication this weekend and next weekend in person. Uh, safe distance, kind of a new system for baby dedication, but it'll be a lot of fun. So if you're around this weekend and can join us for our in-person gathering, be sure to go on our website and register so we have some idea of how many people are coming. And then we'll look forward to seeing you on campus if you can make it. And if you can't, that's why we're doing this uh, online as well. So I'm glad you're joining us either way, either here online or in person. Last week, we were talking about God's prescription for resiliency. And we looked at Philippians chapter four, and in there, Paul makes a really strong case for the fact that our thoughts matter so much. And in today's section of scripture, we're gonna carry that forward and realize uh, at another level, deeper level, how important our thoughts really are. My grandkids have been with us for uh, the Labor Day holiday, and that was really fun. Got to have them here for a few days. And so we were reading a lot of children's books to them. And that took me back in my mind to a particular children's book that I read to my kids when they were young. It's a little Dr. Seuss book called Green Eggs and Ham. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that story, but just to summarize quickly, the main character is in a running dialogue with a person named Sam I Am. And the main character is convinced that he could not possibly like green eggs and ham. Sam I Am, on the other hand, is trying to convince him. So they have this argument going on throughout the entire book between liking them or not liking them. Uh, the main character says, I would not like them here or there. I would not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I Am. Uh, Sam I Am continues to say, I really think you should try them. I think you, I think you might like them. Just open up to the idea, open up to the possibility. Uh, main character continues on. He says, I could not, would not on a boat. I will not, will not with a goat. I will not eat them in the rain. I will not eat them on a train. Not in the dark, not in a tree, not in a car. You let me be. Finally, the end of the book, Sam I Am convinces him to try them. This is the apex of the entire story. It is, the tension is high. And it turns out that he does like them after all. It's, I know I just spoiled it for you, but he loves them actually. And he goes on then to review all the places that he would enjoy green eggs and ham. So he discovers in the end that he was wrong all along, that his basic assumptions were wrong. And I think that that's very instructive for us as well. We have to think about what we're thinking about. We have to ask ourselves, has my thinking gotten off? Or am I thinking correctly? Because the way we think has everything to do with the way things are gonna go in our life. Now what you think about green eggs and ham doesn't matter at all. But what you think about your life, about God, about God's word, about the world, about getting the gospel out to the world, what you think about your values and what's important and what's worth striving for, what's worth working for, what you think about your past and your future, what you think about your setbacks and challenges. What we think about determines so much about how our life will go. And that's why in this passage of scripture, Paul is gonna be very, very clear that in order to be resilient, we have to pay attention to what we're thinking about. Listen to these words from Philippians chapter four, again, carrying on this idea from last week of our thoughts. He says in verse eight, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anybody, or excuse me, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now, you recognize right away, he says, finally, at the beginning of this section. So he's summarizing. He's making his strongest point. He's saying, to kind of pull it all together, think about things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely. And, and then he summarizes, he says, whatever's admirable or praiseworthy or excellent, think about these things. So we're gonna think about those things here for a few minutes 
together. In this section, he, or excuse me, in the entire book of Philippians, Paul uses the word mind 10 times, the word think five times, and the word remember one time. So 16 references to what's going on in our minds. And in this section, he focuses on that more than any other section in the entire letter. And why does he make such a big deal of it? It's simply because what we're thinking about is gonna determine so much about the direction of our lives. What people believe to be true is uh, really the foundation for everything else that unfolds in their life. Now, most people tend to think if circumstances are good, like things are going well, I make enough money, I have enough leisure, then I'm gonna be happy. And if things go badly, I run out of money, or I have health problems, or I have other setbacks, then I'm gonna be un unhappy. What's very interesting in this section, Paul is really saying that our, our uh, emotional well-being, our peace and our joy is really tied up more in where we choose to put our minds. What's fascinating is that many uh, studies underscore this. In fact, there's a University of Minnesota study that I ran across, a guy named David Lichen. He did this, uh, did this pretty extensive study in which he concluded that there's, there's really little connection between life circumstances and a person's predominant mood. In other words, he studied people in all kinds of situations, people that had won the lottery and had all sorts of really fortunate things happen, and then uh, also people that had all sorts of losses and, and were suffering with health problems and so forth. So he studied all these people, and what he concluded was this, that the overwhelming majority of people return to their usual temperaments within a year of their fortune or misfortune. So in other words, if somebody won the lottery and they were a miserable person before they won it, a year later, they'd be back to feeling miserable uh, and vice versa. So he said, really, having some great fortune or misfortune didn't really ultimately change people's moods. Another study, a Stanford University study, revealed that happy people and unhappy people have very similar life experiences. Uh, it's not that happy people just have one good thing after another and unhappy people have one misfortune after another. The difference, the study concluded, is that the average unhappy person spends more than twice as much time thinking about unpleasant thoughts, whereas happy people tend to spend much more time thinking about things they perceive as positive. Now, I thought this was very interesting because in our section of Scripture, Paul's making a really strong case for how important our thoughts are. God's Word is constantly telling us to meditate on all that is good, all that is godly, and oftentimes that's summarized as God's law. Think about what God says. Think about what is true. Uh, Dallas Willard, in his excellent book, Life Without Lack, writes about our ability to think when he says this. He says, the ultimate freedom we have as individuals is the power to select what we will allow or require our minds to dwell upon and think about. By think, we mean all the ways in which we are aware of things, including our memories, perceptions, and beliefs. The focus of your thoughts significantly affects everything else that happens in your life and evokes the feelings that frame your world and motivate your actions. We cannot evoke thoughts by feeling a certain way, but we can evoke and to some degree control our feelings by directing our thoughts. Well, this is the really cool thing, is we actually have the ability to think about what we're thinking about, and we have the ability to choose where we're gonna put our thoughts. If we're willing, we can surrender our thoughts to God. We can consciously say, God, I want you to govern my thoughts. Romans chapter eight says this, those who live in accordance with the Spirit, that's us as believers who are filled with the Spirit, he's saying if we live in accordance with the Spirit, in other words, we're surrendered to the Spirit, he says, then we have our minds set on what the Spirit desires. And then he says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. This idea of govern means guided. So if we're allowing the Spirit to guide our thoughts and our life, we're gonna be at peace. A bit later he adds, 
don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So our minds lead the way. So how do we change our minds? Here's the first thing. Pay attention to what's getting your attention. In Psalm 119, David prayed, turn my eyes away from worthless things. So turning my eyes is a metaphor for, for turning my attention away from worthless things. Same idea happened to Jonah. Uh, he was going the wrong direction in life. In Jonah chapter two, he said, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, O Lord, and my prayer rose to you. In other words, you got my attention again. And then he added a few verses later, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. So where we turn our attention is crucial. So if you're sinking under the weight of some negative thinking like anger or impatience or regret or bitterness or lust or greed or resentment or any of those things, we can choose to change our attention because attention determines direction. Wherever attention goes, that's the direction we go. Uh, somebody has said, whatever gets your attention gets you, which is really true. Listen to those words again from Romans 8. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind that is being guided by God's spirit guides us toward life and toward peace. King Solomon wrote, Proverbs chapter four, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Think about that. He's just saying, again, wherever your attention is going, that's the direction your life is gonna go. He says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. A few verses later, he sums it up when he says, give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Think about where you're going. Hundreds of years later, Jesus used a very interesting metaphor and it's a little confusing right off the top, so I'm gonna read it to you and then let's look at it together for just a minute because it's a really incredible uh, symbol. He says in Matthew 6, the eye is the lamp of your whole body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, it's really interesting. This is a fascinating picture. He says, the, the eye is the lamp of the body. In our culture, we don't use lamps the way they did back then, but go back in time to the time of Jesus and remember they had oil lamps. So maybe you've been camping and you've been out in the dark walking with say, uh, a lantern, a kerosene lantern, and you know you hold it up above your head and it shines the way, or it lights up the way. In the same way, they would walk with oil lamps and they would hold it up high and they, would, they could see where they were going by holding up this lamp. So he is saying here, the eye is the lamp of the whole body. What your eye takes in or what you're focused on, what gets your attention is what controls your entire life. He says, if your eyes are healthy, in other words, what you're paying attention to is good, your whole body will be full of light. Everything else about your life will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, everything else is gonna be darkness. And he says, and, and if, if that light within you is darkness, in other words, whatever that little thing you're looking at is dark, your whole body's gonna be full of darkness. Whatever you focus on is gonna have a dramatic effect in your entire life. Now, if you happen to look up that passage in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 to 23, you'll notice that the passage right before it is all about money. God, Jesus is saying, don't get fixated on, on what you can amass. And in the passage right after this, he says you can't serve both God and money. So his point here is, if your life focus, everything you're focused on is getting more, having more, everything that's just temporal, well, that level of light is actually just gonna be darkness within you. It's gonna lead you on a dark path. It doesn't lead to life. So right here he points out, whatever you're focused on, whatever's getting your attention is gonna be the direction your whole life 
will go. Uh, the author of the book of Hebrews summed up this truth about Jesus when he says we must pay more careful attention to what we've heard so that we don't drift away. So he's been talking about Jesus, and then he says we must pay careful attention to what we're learning from Jesus. Remember, attention determines direction. That's why Paul says pay attention to these, to these things, things that are right and pure and noble and lovely and all, all sorts of uh, things that are good. So the second thing I want you to think about here is interrogate the value of what you're thinking about. These things that Paul brings up are valuable. What's noble or honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, they have, they have high value. So I have to ask myself, am I spending time thinking about things that are valuable, that have high value, that are godly, that are worthwhile? Psalm 1, verse 2 says, blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, remember, law means truth. So am I thinking about, am I delighting in what's true? He says, the one who meditates on these truths day and night will be blessed. It's like Jesus gave us a new mental script. And then he sent the Holy Spirit to live within us to remind us of that mental script. But then it's up to us to choose, to will, to allow ourselves to be governed or guided by that, by the Spirit of God that reminds us of that mental script. Jesus prayed for his followers, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And Paul instructed the church at Colossae, he said, let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. Keep coming back, keep meditating let this dwell in you. That's the difference between just knowing something on the surface or hearing something and walking away. He says, let it dwell in you. Really meditate on it. Let it sink in. That's the same idea as in Psalm chapter 1. What we're thinking about controls everything. And if our thoughts are all negative, that's going to control our life as well. Pamela Butler, in a great book called Talking to Yourself, she writes this. When self-talk is negative... You're creating a toxic environment for yourself. What's more, you'll carry this internal environment with you, regardless of your physical location. How a person reacts to a particular stress is very much related to that person's own self-talk. To the exact same circumstance, one person will react with depression. It's hopeless, I'll never succeed. Another with anger and blame. It's all their fault. And a third with optimism. Well, you can't win them all. I'll do better next time. Thoughts are like seeds, and they grow into something. They can grow into weeds, or they can grow into something beautiful. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 says, let's fix our thoughts on Jesus. So the more we focus on all that is good, the more our mind uh, continues to lead us in a way that is life-giving. Meditating is simply choosing to turn thoughts over and over and over again in our mind. And scripture gives us a lot of truth to turn over in our minds. Jesus prayed for us that we would be turning over truth in our minds. Some of those truths, I've just listed some here just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about when I say turning over truth in your mind. Here's a few key phrases. Every one of these are right from God's word. Christ lives in me. The spirit has set me free. My body is the residence of the Holy Spirit. He who began a good work in me is going to complete it. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God works for the good of those who love him. Nothing can ever separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. God is faithful. He will not let me be tempted beyond what I can bear. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God's grace is sufficient for me in every one of my trials. My light and momentary troubles are achieving for me an eternal glory that far outweigh them all. And he is able to do immeasurably more than all I imagine or ask according to his power that is at work in me. Now that's just a smattering of thoughts. Just a few lifted right out of scripture. And there's so many more. 
The question is, will we train our minds to stay focused on those truths? Or do we fill our minds with all sorts of negative talk that is really destructive? Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, be made new in the attitude of your mind. And to the church at Colossae, set your minds on things above. In other words, we have the ability to choose what we do with our thoughts. So Paul said in verse 9, Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. So he says, think about all these things and then think about my example, how I've lived, how I've actually put those thoughts to action. Which brings us to our third point. Decide to take steps in the direction you want to go. So think about where your thoughts are going and really interrogate those thoughts and ask, are my thoughts valuable? Are they worthwhile? Are they godly? Are they life-giving? And then take steps in the direction you want to go. Um, we can change our minds by replacement. So I love this illustration of, uh, of a glass tube with marbles inside. Listen to it. I think it'll help you think through how we can replace our thoughts with good thoughts. So one person writes, suppose you have a long glass tube, the exact diameter of a marble laying on its side with openings at both ends. Presently, the tube contains exactly 100 black marbles filling the tube in single file from one end to the other. Your goal is to fill the tube with 100 white marbles, but you can only re remove one black marble per day. How many days will it take to fill the tube with white marbles? Well, obviously 100 days. As you push one new white marble in one end of the tube each day, a black marble will fall out of the tube on the opposite end. By the 100th day, in with a white marble, out with a black, the tube will become full of white marbles. I think that's a great illustration of how we change our minds. We can't change our mind all at once. It's a process. It's deciding moment by moment, each day, what we will allow to fill our minds. We can be filled more and more with godly thoughts, things that are noble, right, true, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, or we can think or fill our minds with really defeating thoughts. Attention determines direction, and decision determines destiny. What we choose to do has everything to do with where we're going to end up. And we can't just decide for our whole life. Like, we can't decide, okay, for the rest of my life, I'm going to spend 15 minutes a day in God's Word. But we can choose what we're going to do today. We can choose what we're going to do right now. A decision to turn your worries into prayers. A decision to apologize to somebody. A decision to, say, get into a recovery group. A decision to get out of a relationship that's dragging you down or away from your faith. The decision to participate in a place of service for the kingdom of God. A decision to spend time in scripture, less time in social media. A decision to forgive somebody. Maybe a decision to honor God with your resources or to get into a small Bible study group or to get honest about the kind of media that's actually filling your mind and heart. Or a decision to, well, you fill in the blank. You see, we change our minds one thought at a time. We change our lives one decision at a time. Paul says both. He says, pay attention to where your thoughts are going, interrogate them, think about what you're thinking about, and then really assess their value. Are they helping you? Are they positive thoughts? Are they godly thoughts? Are they truthful thoughts? And then decide. He says, put into practice these things. Put into practice the things you see me do. Follow my example. Take steps in the direction you want to go because attention determines direction and decision determines our ultimate destiny. Listen to this bit of wisdom from Henry David Thoreau. He says, as a single footstep will not make a path on the earth, so a single thought will not make a pathway in the mind. To make a deep physical path, we walk again and again. To make a deep mental path, we must think over and over the kind of thoughts we wish to dominate our lives. So what are you thinking about? And what decisions are you making today? Verse 9 again, Paul says, 
put it into practice, and the result, the peace of God will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. Actually, true, both are true. The God of peace will be with you, and the peace of God will be with you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you've given us an incredible manual for resiliency. I thank you, Lord, that you give us the ability to choose our thoughts and choose our steps. And I pray that today you would move in us by your spirit to really pay attention to what we're thinking about and to make choices that will move us closer, uh, closer to your heart, move us forward in the way you want us to go. I pray that you would help us to be surrendered to your spirit, that you've put within us to guide us, to convict us, to help us in this process. And I thank you, Lord, for your word that keeps bringing us back to truth. Help us to focus on that and less on all the things that drag us down and drag us away from you. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, family. Sing this hymn together, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When I once was lost, but now am found. I was blind, but now. I see Every